even English literature was a latecomer to the Academy. Therefore, the novel, being a latecomer to this latecomer already, did not really made it to the curriculum in the English departments worldwide by the 1950s. I think. In fact, even by the mid 1980s, it was so marginal that taking any graduate seminar related with fiction would be considered as quite sidetracked. Now. Major theorists of the novel, such as Franco Moretti, hailed this field of study as a great anthropological force, highlighting its close examination of humankind by redefining the sense of reality and the meaning of individual existence. As now, scholars of the world celebrate the novel's plurality, as the borders of literature are continuously and unpredictably expanded. In today's episode of the Global Novel, we will concentrate on the rise of the novel. Especially its philosophical underpinnings and its main characteristics that set it apart from its predecessors, the epic and prose fiction, as well as other early forms of novel from different cultures and traditions. Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host Greg, and I'm your host Claire. To begin with, the contemporary English word for a long work of prose fiction derives from the Italian novella, for new or news or. Short story of something new, which is itself from the Latin novella, a singular noun use of the neuter plural novellus, meaning new. It is in this way that the novel designates a new narrative form, one that is strikingly different from prior traditions and standards. But in what sense, and compared with what specifically? Where exactly is its demarcation from pre-modern prose fiction, like La Princesa de Clive or Ethiopica? Or even epic fiction, should we even include the water margin from China and tale of Genji from Japan when we talk about the novel? Well, like Moretti once envisioned, and whom you just quoted, the novel is indeed becoming more plural when its borders are continuously expanding, and especially under the recent scrutiny of philosophical post-structuralism and the rise of post-colonial studies. The novel is facing two major problems. One is metropolitanism or provincialism, and the other is the issue of periodization. And here we have, on the one hand, the novel is indeed much of a European construct, and it is often born from major literary centers like Paris, New York, and London. And especially with the emergence of the so-called modernity, we can say that the novel is a product of、uh, illustrious colonialism and capitalism, thereby. It precludes other novelistic achievement from other countries, and especially the so-called less developed cultures. The issue of periodization lies precisely in what Xu Mei Shi calls a European timeline, when the East is always construed as the past of the West. Therefore, novels from the East are often deemed as either old or primitive, and I think these are the key issues in the current debate. And there is. Um, clearly, urgent need to reorient and re-theorize the novel with a new set of global aesthetic standards. And to answer your first question, the English novel certainly begins with Defoe, Richardson, and Fielding, who created a new way of fiction writing that sets their narrative、uh, drastically apart from their predecessors, called prose fiction or romance. In his monograph, *The Rise of the Novel*, Ian Watt highlights. This sort of self-consciousness, when Defoe, Richardson, and Fielding created their characters in a more realistic fashion, focusing more on the ordinary sexual appetite, picaresque tale, economic or carnal motives, and more truthful representation of human behavior. So this new way of representing characters parallels the ideal of French philosophical realism, which endorsed a more dispassionate and scientific scrutiny of life. Um, and for sure, the novel arose in the modern period, where general intellectual orientation was most decisively separated from its classical and medieval heritage by its rejection or or reverse of the universals. Could you elaborate on this philosophical realism? Sure. The general temper of philosophical realism is this critical, anti-traditional, and innovating method that emphasizes on the particulars of human experience. A representative of this philosophical trend is, as you probably know, Rene Descartes, whose famous "cogito ergo sum," meaning "I think, therefore I exist," jibes with this philosophical trend that the pursuit of truth is often conceived of as a wholly individual matter.
and it's logically、um, independent of the tradition of past thought, right? So the novel's primary criterion was truth to individual experience, which is always unique and therefore new.、Uh, and in this way, it sets an unprecedented value on originality, and hence the name. The novel, specifically, Ian Watt observes that Defoe and Richardson are the first great writers in our literature who did not take their plots from mythology, history, legend, or previous literature. In this, they differ a lot from Chaucer, Spencer, and Shakespeare, or, or Milton, who endorsed the writers of Greece and Rome and who habitually used traditional plots. And they did so because they they accepted the general premise of their times already. Since nature is essentially complete and unchanging, and this is all Ian Watt, by the way, its records, whether scriptural, legendary, or historical, constitute a definitive repertoire of human experience. And this point of view continued to be expressed until the 19th century. The opponents of Balzac, for example, use it to deride his preoccupation with contemporary. Uh, ephemeral reality, but at the same time, from the Renaissance onwards, there was this this growing tendency for individual experience to replace the、uh, overall collective tradition as the ultimate arbiter of reality. And this transition would seem to constitute an important part of the general cultural background of the rise of the novel. And then Ian Watt goes on to point out that from the medieval belief in the reality of universals, realism had come to denote a belief in the individual apprehension of reality through the senses. Similarly, the term original, which in the Middle Ages had meant having existed from the first, came to mean underived, independent, firsthand. In a nutshell, literary criticism deems the plot to be acted out by particular people in particular circumstances, rather than by general human types against a background primarily determined by the appropriate literary convention. What are the main features of the novel? There are three prominent features of the novel, according to Ian Watt. The first is the individualization of his characters, and the second is the detailed background and environment, and the third is its emphasis on the semantic or the language. As to the first feature, individualized characterization, the question is often, how do you particularize a certain character, right?、Um, because as once Descartes had given the thought processes within the individual's consciousness supreme importance. The philosophical problem connected with personal identity naturally attracted a great deal of attention. So, in literary realism, for example, one aspect of being influenced by this tradition of realist thought is naming of individual character with ordinary names. Philosophically, the problem of individual identity is closely related to the epistemological status of proper names, and according to Hobbes. Proper names bring to mind one thing only: universals recall any one of many. So, proper names have exactly the same function in social life. They are verbal expressions of the particular identities of each individual person. It is in this way that we can understand how this function of proper names was first established in the novel. Another important aspect about the novel is the background and environment within which characters thrive. This doesn't simply just mean、um, the setting of a novel, but time and space in which a certain character was living. As Watt argues, literature prior to the novel is ahistorical, so this ahistorical outlook is associated with a striking lack of interest in the minute-by-minute -minute and day-to-day -day temporal setting.、Um, as a result, one can consider that. The sequence of these times and events in Shakespeare and his contemporaries, for example, are set in a very abstract continuum of time and space, and allows very little importance of time as a factor in human relationship. Compared with this, Defoe's Robinson Crusoe convinces us completely that his narrative is occurring at a particular place and a particular time, and our memory of his novels consists largely of these vivid, realized moments in the lives of his characters, and moments which are loosely strung together to form a sort of convincing biological perspective. We have a sense of personal identity subsisting through duration, and yet. Being changed by the flow of experience, 
because introspection shows that we cannot easily visualize any particular moment of existence without setting it in a special context. Also, Defoe would seem to be the first of our writers who visualized the whole of his narrative as though it occurred in an actual physical environment. The third characteristic of the novel is this self-consciousness and its motive of expression. A regular feature of the romances that predates the novel is its figurative language, which are much rarer in prose of in the prose of Defoe and Richardson. According to Watt, the previous stylistic tradition for fiction was not primarily concerned with the correspondence of words to things, but rather with the extrinsic beauty which could be bestowed upon description and action by the use of rhetoric. The novel therefore carries the ideal that. Language is used as a source of interest in its own right, rather than as a purely referential medium. Novelists like Defoe and Richardson made sure that an author's skill was born not in the closeness with which he made his words correspond to their objects, but in the literary sensitivity with which his style reflected in the linguistic decorum that is appropriate to its subject. Therefore, Watt says the prose norm of the Augustan period remained much too literary to to be the natural voice of Mo Flanders or Palama Andrews. However, Watt does emphasize realism in philosophy and literature as two separate, parallel manifestations of larger change, especially with their individualism antithetical to medieval unified worldview. And he refuses to acknowledge these two different trends, namely one philosophical, the other literary, to be influencing each other. What is the social context that gave rise to the novel? Well, in the rise of the novel, Ian Watt argues that the emergence of the novel reflects the changes in a gradually industrialized society where the organization of the reading public takes on a new look. We know people's literary level was generally low, given that the educational system was hardly existing by the time of 1788. So books are very expensive to buy for the working class, who wouldn't be the consumer of the novel, right? So the only people who could read a novel were the middle class, who were economically capable and who had the leisure time to read. And we also know that its major consumers were largely women, usually middle class housewives and maids. Um, reading novel kept them busy and docile enough not to steal their husbands' jobs.、Um, to use Ian Watt's observation that、um, these two major new 18th-century literary forms, namely the newspaper and the novel, encouraged a rapid, inattentive, almost unconscious kind of reading habit. By the mid-18th century, private book publishers rose to power. They basically monopolized the journalist industry as well. These people were not the elite member of the society, but they had received some kind of education, so they could read, and、uh, they would hire writers to write very explicitly and even tautologically, so as to target at the less educated readers who would understand these,、uh, let's say, discourse easily, right? And the publisher's goal. Was clearly to sell stories to the mass, and that explains part of the reason why the prose style of the novel in the beginning of its emergence were often very easy and unpremeditated. It is in this way that novelists like Defoe and Richardson found their proximity to a broader mass, and that's that's just one aspect of the novel. But on the other hand, writers like them do. Uh, reflect larger and even more important feature of the life、uh, of their time, which is the great power and self confidence of the middle class as a whole.、Um, Ian Watt stresses how this came together in a genre of private accounts read privately, permitting a sort of intimacy unattainable in other publicly performed or publicly enjoyed styles of work that. Both extended the bounds of what seemed permissible in art and allowed a new intensity of audience identification with protagonists. One of the representation of such intimacy is the writing of letters, which has largely been introduced into the novel.、Um, interestingly, the familiar letter, of course, can be 
an opportunity for a much fuller and more unreserved expression of the writer's own private feelings than oral converse usually affords, because it allows you to peek instantly into a character's inner thoughts. As the daily experience of the individual is composed of a ceaseless flow of thought, feeling, and sensation, and this is why, if you remember the last chapter of of James Joyce, Ulysses is so experimental and yet so truthful to the representation of the character Molly's interiority. It is this sort of minute by minute content of consciousness which.、Um, Which constitutes what the individual's personality really is, and dictates his relationship or her relationship to others. And it is only by contact with this consciousness that a reader can participate fully in in the life of a fictional character. Thus, there is this immediacy of every circumstance that a character is put in particular time and space, and that's why. The、uh, emergence of the novel is so successful in its realistic depiction. Also, the citizens of the 18th century London had a horizon that was, in many ways,、um, not unlike the、uh, modern urban man. Right? We can almost imagine the streets and the place of resort in the various quarters of the town presented in infinite variety of ways of life that,、uh, just like ours, ways of life that. Anyone could observe, and yet, for the most part, utterly alien to any one individual's personal experience. Likewise, writers like Defoe and Richardson had to withdraw from this sort of alienation by retreating to a suburban home where they can engage in writing. Whereas female consumers of the novel read what they wrote in order to escape the stress of urbanization as well. It is precisely this remark, along with the chapter on epic theory of the novel, that invited the Hungarian philosopher Diodia Lukac to think of the novel as a form within this sort of medieval world historical totality, right? And and also the historical way in which the form reflects the quality of social life, just as Ian Watt observes. The central theme, however, of Lukács' theory of the novel is is quite、uh, is this sort of quite Marxian comparison between the epic and the novel. The former being a literary form of the Greek city-state, and the latter of capitalism. So, in a Hegelian account of the world historical totality, Lukács basically argues that. Unlike the epic, which finds its unity given so that it can directly reflect a sort of self-contained and meaningful world, the novel is in a continuous critical relation to a sort of estranged and meaningless realm of experience. And this implicit social critique of criticism leads Lukács to characterize the novel as a rather problematic genre, which is a form. Continually questioning itself and its own bases,、uh, and a form very critical of its social values as well. Could you give examples of other emerging novel forms in other cultures and from other literary traditions? Sure. In Spain, for example, there is nothing like Don Quixote before,、um, although it has multiple points of contact with existing literature. The Spanish public seems to like it at once.、Um, for in the realm of prose fiction, there was a ready reception for novelty and experiment, specifically anti-heroic, materialistic, plebeian, and picaresque was in effect, if not in intention, a reaction against a heroic, idealistic, aristocratic romance, particularly the romance of chivalry, which had dominated the field in the 16th century. But at the time of Don Quixote, the、uh, romance of chivalry was in deep decline already. Although in its pastoral and other forms, romance was still flourishing. The last new book of chivalry in Spain was actually published in 1602. Like other picaresque novels, Don Quixote reacted against these works, but in a、uh, profoundly different and deliberate manner. Right, the relationship is. Parodic in a very unique and special way, 
Cervantes made fun of chivalry romances in a way that did not rule out affection for it,、uh, while still enjoying their soaring imagination and superhuman heroics. He certainly used a parody to reverse the romantic chivalry, making it almost like a realistic novel. One of the greatest features of the novel is is the dialogue, especially between the knight and the square,、um, but also involving many others. This scale, the conversations are unprecedented in previous prose fiction for their realism as vehicles of characterization and for the way they are used to gloss, enlarge upon, distort, and substitute for straight narration. So, never in literature had verbal discourse been shown as so integral to experience to experience before. And so, that's Don Quixote. And from the early Spanish novel, we can see that the novel is inseparably linked to the unique stages and patterns of development that define recent European cultural history. East Asian countries like China, Korea, Vietnam, and Japan, however, use the word "xiao shuo," which literally means small talks or petty talks, to refer to works of fiction of、uh, whatever length. Such a term originated from the ancient Chinese classification of literature works into small talks, which means tales of daily life and trivial matters, and great talks,、uh, which means sacred classic works of great thinkers like Confucius, for example. In other words, ancient definition of small talks merely refer to trivial affairs, trivial facts and matters, and it can be different from the Western concept of the novel. Andrew Plax, who is a noted expert on Chinese narratology, has once said, "If one called the Chinese 小说 as the novel, that would be the logical equivalent of calling a shark a kind of dolphin, or a small owl a bat."、Um, how can one possibly apply the name by which we know the、uh, quintessential expression of the Western literary imagination over the last three centuries to anything other than works of the European and North American corpus? So the easiest solution to this apparent terminological impasse would be simply to jettison the term novel from the baggage of comparative literature scholarship in dealing with any non-Western or pre-modern texts. And I think that's smart. And this answers really to your question on whether we can incorporate Tale of Ganji or Water Margin. Into the category of the novel, the answer is no. Interestingly, Plax did point out the significant areas of convergence between what we customarily call the classic novel in China and in Europe. So similarities are, for example, and here I quote: the position of the novel within the spectrum of traditional literary genres, the structural and rhetorical analysis of the of its fundamental poetics. The cultural and political implications of vernacular and popular modes of narration, the roots of the new form in social and cultural history, the triumph of mimetic realism, and then the gradual deflection of its assumed objective orientation into the dimension of internal subjectivity, the essentially ironic focus of the novel's characteristic. Rhetorical stance and the relation between this exonerable shift towards interior selfhood and certain concurrent philosophical trends shaping the intellectual milieu from which the novel sprang. Take one of the earliest Chinese novel,、um, Water Margin, for example, whose genre resists translation, and as the Chinese name goes by, Shui Ku Zhuan, and Zhuan literally means. Or signify something quite different from the novel.、Uh, it means legend or romance, and it is a completely different novelistic genre from Europe. However, Shui Hu Zhuan or Water Margin is also the product of its own social and literary forces, right? Especially, it is generally acknowledged by many critics as the Chinese literati novel. It represents a completely new phase within its respective narrative tradition, in terms of narratorial and rhetorical features of telling the story of a hundred and eight heroic outlaws. 
it belongs to this first phase of spectacular creativity. Actually, during the course of the 16th century, at the height of the late Ming literati culture, under the philosophical influence of the new Confucianists. Who clearly formed their own aesthetic ideal, which brought forth the superior ascension of all the、uh, so-called four masterworks out of their all oral circulation. So, similarly, in both spheres, the novel is firmly anchored in the configurations of their respective literary histories. If you enjoyed this episode, you can show your support through theglobalnovel.com/donate. With your help, we can keep making education and literature easily and widely accessible to fans of great literature around the world. Thank you so much for listening.